All right. Every row has a nominee. All right, so what I need you nominees and everyone in the room to do is look at the screen. Hey, Siri, give me a 30-second timer. Where's Waldo? Siri, baby. So I want you guys to look at the screen. In 30 seconds, you're going to turn around and no longer be able to look at the screen. You're going to be asked about the screen. Five, four, three, two, one. Turn around. All right, no more looking at the screen. Everybody in a line, looking forward, and Kiki is going to be asking you questions. We're going to go one by one. If you miss the question, you have to go back to your row. You're a loser. <laughs> How do we answer? No, it's oh, one okay. person. All right, Haley, sit down. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, you're up next. What is the family roasting over the fire? <laughs> All the way to the end. Uh, so, guys, move it down as we go. coming down, no looking. What color is the sky? Orange is blue? Nope. Orange is blue? It's a weird color. That's the thing. What color is the sky? Down. Come on, keep it going. What color is the tent on the right side? Uh, purple. Nope. Purple. <laughs> what color is the tent on the right side? No pressure. No. Tent on the right side. Is it blue? Yes. All right. What game are the boy and girl playing in the center of the picture? Yes. What kind of trailer is being towed by the car? Camper? So it doesn't have a specific name? Yes. You might not know. What color is it? Uh, is it gr uh, is it like brown? No. Dang it. Gray was it was gray. Oh. <laughs> I know. Um, what animals are on the table in the foreground? A squirrel or two squirrels and a raccoon, I think. Oh wait, you're yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And Ellie did not cheat. We did not tell her the game in advance. So Ellie wins a gift card and her whole row wins some Snickers. Where are the Snickers cards? So we'll, we'll get the Snickers up. All right. So we, uh, as soon as this gets handed out, we are going to hear from, you guys probably heard Smed mention Emmett this morning. Uh, Emmett is going to come up. I'm going to. He had quite, quite the incident. He's going to tell you about this week, and so he's going to share some uh, about what happened, so you guys can all appreciate God's grace uh, towards him. God's uh, 
grace towards us that we get to still have Emmett here with us. Emmett, come on up. So Emmett, can you share just what, what happened to you this week? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, so, <laughs> no, yeah, I was heading to baseball practice, um, and I was like 2.1 miles away from the baseball practice when this crash happened. And it, it was just like a two-lane road, so one lane going east, one lane going west. So I was going east, but then I hit, the, there was like this curve um, in the road, and there's like no divider in between the two lanes, and so I looked down for one second to see how many miles I had to go to get to the baseball practice. Um, and as I looked down, there was like a turn in the road that I just missed. And so I ended up in the left lane and I was headed straight for a semi truck. And so I swerved last minute to avoid it. So I hit the front side of it and spun out. Um, but yeah, had I not looked up soon enough, it could have been a head on collision. I definitely would not have made it. So yeah, that looks <laughs> centimeters from this is where you were sitting, right? Yeah. Yeah. From us not having Emmett. So that's uh, sobering, right? One, I mean, the, the, your response time, your less than a second was the difference between being dead and, and alive. And uh, you were telling me today about some of just what that's done to you, some of the, the thoughts that are going, going through your mind in the days after. Uh, an event like that. It's not every day that you realize just how close to meeting Jesus face to face uh, we are. So do you want to share a little bit about about what's been going on in your heart since then? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like God uses trials just to grow you. And so it's just a good reminder just that, I mean, I don't deserve to live, but God almost took my life um, yesterday. But, you know, he still decided to stay, sustain me. He's still decided to keep me on this earth. Um, and so that's just like a grace from God, and I realized just, um, yeah, like, yeah, he just, I don't, I don't know, he just, he's just, like, he kept me on the earth, and so I just realized, like, I don't want to waste the life that he's given me. Like, he allowed me to continue to live, and I want to use that to glorify God instead of wasting it, um, and just serve the purpose of what I was created for. Like, I was created to glorify God, and so I just realized I and mean, I was that close to death, but then, you know, God sustained my life and, you know, the purpose for him allowing me to continue to go on living is just to live for his glory. And so, um, that really, that thought just really hit me. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, when we are faced with our sudden mortality, it's so easy to go through life thinking the days are just going to continue just like they've been. And when you have an event like that happen, it can affect you. Certainly it affects you for a day. By God's grace, this will continue to affect you on into eternity. Like you said, that you will live every day for God's glory. Um, you wanted to share this with your fellow students because you didn't want it to only affect you. What, uh, what kind of encouragement would you have now for, for your fellow students? Yeah. So, I mean, it was just a good reminder that my life is in God's hands, um, and I'm not in control of it. My life is not my own. It belongs to God, and so I don't want to live selfishly. Um, I don't want to continue living selfishly. I want to live for the Lord. And so that's just an encouragement for everyone else. Um, just, it's a good reminder that, like, God is the one that's sustaining your lives. Like, you, you can't control whether you're going to die tomorrow or die tonight. Um, just live your life for the Lord. Glorify him and just don't waste your life. Yeah. Amen. Thanks, Emmett. Let's uh thank you. Let's uh let's just pray. And then uh, Chris, Cooper, Eliana, you can come up and uh, and lead us in worship. But God, thank you. Thank you for sustaining each one of us today. We woke up because you sustained us overnight and we breathed breaths that we don't deserve by your grace. And God, thank you that today we get to hear Emmett tell us about the near miss instead of us mourn the loss of our dear friend. 
So thank you so much that you looked up what he did, that he swerved and just nicked the edge of that semi instead of taking the face on. God, I pray that this would be a means of making Emmett not want to waste his life and that you would even, one of the kids who, who heard this, one of the leaders, that you would grip us with the reality that this life is short. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Some of us might be planning on waiting a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years to repent, thinking that, oh yeah, the chances are good and we'll keep living. Let's live life for today and, and tomorrow I'll get right with God. But God, this is a, a potent lesson that that may not be true. Any one of us could die tonight. And but when we stand before you, God, the only way that we can stand before you is the hope hope of being in your presence and not being under your judgment is Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So God, I pray that he speaks that today would be a day where they don't waste their life. God, I pray that with that in mind, we would uh, we would worship you uh, with all of our hearts, with all of our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We are going to jump back into part three of how to read your Bible. We're finally ready to get to the practical. How do you actually read your Bible? We've learned what the Bible is last week. We, we learned that the, the Bible is God's inspired word. If you don't have a note sheet, um, can you raise your hand? The note sheets will be particularly helpful today. Because I don't want you having to scribble like crazy, so I wrote down some of the things that you'll want to know. Um, and there's a glossary on the back of this part, this review from last week. If you don't have a note sheet, raise your hand. So we, we remembered last week, or learned last week, that the Bible is God's very word. Every word in the Bible comes from God as if it were breathed out by him, even though human authors wrote it. God used these authors to write exactly what he wanted them to, so every single part of the Bible is God's word. It's inspired, and so it cannot be wrong. It's unfailable, we learned in our definition last week. And because it can't be wrong, therefore it isn't. It's both infallible and inerrant. Because it's God's word, it holds authority over us. And it has everything that we need to know God. Everything we need to live a life pleasing, for him, pleasing to him. It's necessary. The Bible's sufficient. We don't need to run outside of the Bible to look for things, self-help books, psychology, science, or anything else for solutions to our problems, especially our, our problems related to God and, and living in a godly way, knowing how we're to live. The Bible is, is sufficient and the Bible's clear. This last point, the Bible is clear, leads us to today's lesson. The Bible is written so that anyone who approaches it with faith, right? Don't forget the lessons we learned prior to this, the part one of how to read your Bible. Anyone who approaches the Bible with faith the help of the Holy Spirit, having the veil removed, the light shined into your hearts, the darkness that's over your understanding through hardness of heart, as you may have read two days ago if you're on the, the, the bookmark reading plan, that that's, that darkness has been removed and you have knowledge. If God is at work in you, you can understand the Bible on your own. You don't need priests. You don't need the church to help you. Now, 
pastors can help you understand the Bible. God actually gave the church pastors, teachers to equip you for the work of ministry through giving you knowledge. Ephesians 4, if you, like I said, if you guys were on the reading plan, you just read that. You certainly can use help. You should actually use each other to help. There's great books. We've never had more books, more helps to help us understand the Bible. But you don't need them in the sense that apart from those things, apart from those helps, the truths of Scripture, especially the truth of the gospel, um, it, it's available to you without mediation of someone else. And this is important because for a long time in church history, the church, not the real church, but the church that called itself the church actually hid the scriptures. Said this is too dangerous for people to have. This is too dangerous for people to read because then they might, they might read it and they might think they understand it. But those were people who wanted the power to be in themselves, not in the word. And so what they did was they, they hid the truth of God's word and they actually hid God's word. They read it in a language that none of the people, except for the special ones, spoke Latin. Um, the church services hid the truth of God's word. And the Reformation started largely because God's word was made known to the people not primarily through preaching and teaching, although that came on its heels, but just by translating God's word into the language of the plowboy. That, that word plowboy, you might hear it. Uh, William Tyndale mentioned it. William Tyndale uh, set, wanted to ensure that even the boy that drives the plow, meaning the, the, the kid who who went behind the oxen in the field and pushed the, pushed the cart to till the soil, even that one who didn't have much education but could hear God's word in his own language, maybe even learn to read it in his own language, his goal in translating the Bible into English and ultimately dying for it was so that the plowboy, who had less education than every single person in this room, could understand it, and he was successful. God's word was translated to English. God's word was translated to German. God's word started being translated into languages and the world blew up. People started hearing the gospel in God's word and God's spirit opened the eyes of their heart and they believed. Lubat was accomplished. They listened and they understood because it was in their language. And the Holy Spirit brought, brought belief, brought faith, and all of a sudden there were Christians who based their faith on the truth of God's word. Martin Luther fought. He, he said that the, the Bible was not the exclusive domain of priests or scholars. You might hear Smedley on a Sunday morning, on this morning, stand up and say things. And you're like, how did you get that out of this text? I, I didn't even know what it was talking about. Now we have nine marks of who the 144,000 are, an application to us. Oh, Smedley's so smart. Actually, what you're going to see today is exactly what Smedley did. He just asked a question of the text and went to the text, studied real hard. He spent his life to do this, but asked the question of the text and the authority was in the text. It's not this school of theology says this is what it means or our church says this is what it means. He just said, let's ask a question of the text and find the answers. We do not need, or the, the knowledge that's in the scriptures is not the exclusive domain of priests, scholars, pastors, the really, really educated or the really, really smart. It's clear, it's accessible to all believers. So Martin Luther also mentioned a plowboy. And remember, the plowboy had less education than every single person in this room. We are incredibly blessed with the education we have. And what's so sweet is when you are in school, working hard to read something that doesn't ultimately matter for eternity, knowing, hey, I need to know how to read God's word 
well, I, that should motivate you to, to learn how to read everything else well. Your reading muscles are, are like your, your muscles in your arms, your muscles in your legs. They get better. They get stronger as you use them. And Martin Luther said, a plowboy with scripture in his hand would be more learned than the Pope. The one who they thought held all of the authority in the church, but who didn't believe the truth of the scripture, didn't read it to know the truth, didn't go to scripture as authoritative, as necessary, as inerrant, as infallible. That very educated man knew less than the plowboy with scripture in his hand who believed these things about it and came to God's word prayerfully, came to God's word humbly, came to God's word seeking to see God in his scripture. So I, this last truth that scripture is clear, that it can actually be understood, it was written to be understood. Scripture is not written in a way to hide the truth. It's written in a way that you can know the truth. That, that reality should encourage us all to read the Bible for ourselves. And that when you hear somebody else teach, you hold them to the standard of Scripture. You say, Jacob, I, I, I want to see if what you're saying holds, holds up to what the Bible says. Why did you say that? Can you show me from the text? If a friend comes to you, like, I need help. I'm struggling with blank. You know what you two can say? You can say, what does the Bible say? And open up your Bible and find answers. And that's what I want us to get to. That's the point of the lesson today. And that's the point of the foundation that we've been building. So that you can read the Bible for yourself. This isn't something that tomorrow you're going to be just as good at as you will be in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. It's something that you grow in. But I promise you, the ones who you look to them and say, man, that person knows so much about God's word. God's word has impacted that individual so much. I mean, I'm looking out at, at Rose, at your leaders who know God's word. They weren't born like this. They didn't get like this primarily through education. They got like this because they kept their bottom in the chair and their eyes in the scriptures day after day after day, year after year after year. And they sought to please God through applying what they heard, what they read to their lives. So how do we read the Bible. Well, we read the Bible well, recognizing what it is. And so the, the way that we're going to talk about this, there's lots of ways you can talk about studying the Bible. This is not authoritative and fallible, but where this comes from, that we should listen to God's word, that we should observe it. And then based on those observations, we should seek. So this says observation is what does the text say? Once we know what it says, we should seek to understand what it means. And only then, after we know what it says and what it means, do we say, how does it apply to me? Right? We pray, God, help me listen. Give me self-control to listen to your words. Or if you're reading it on a page, to, to read. To read carefully. To read diligently. To read systematically. And then say, God, give me understanding. Not merely a, a grammatical understanding, but give me a true understanding, an understanding that, that responds in faith, an understanding that when I see you, God, when I see something about you in the text, I worship. When I see a command, I obey. When your word reveals sin to me, I confess and I repent. You say, God, give me that kind of understanding and then form in my heart. Do the miracle that we read about, the miracle that 2 Corinthians 3, the miracle that 1 Corinthians 2, the miracle that it's all over Scripture talks about of granting us belief, obedience, 
and trust in God's word. The reason why, we, why I say we should do this is because the Bible is written to be understood. That's what you do with any other text. If I gave you, how, ma how many of you guys are, have been in a science lab? If you've, if you've been in a science lab and, and they give you an instruction for, here's the experiment we're going to do today. If you start doing the experiment, if you start trying to do this application bit before you understand the process written out on the, the experiment, usually it doesn't go well. I used to be that kind of, because I was so impatient. I remember in my high school labs, I would screw up like probably nine times out of 10, because I'd jump in and be like, oh yeah, I understand this. I know where this is going. And I'd start getting in and I'd mix something wrong in chemistry. I'd mix the wrong thing and nothing happened. I look over at the other table and they're getting the color changes and mine's not doing anything. I, I, I jumped ahead to the doing and I didn't actually take the time to read the steps in the lab to understand where we were going. And then when I went back, I'm like, oh, I missed step three. It was there all along. I missed it. I just didn't see it. Your lab instructions are not infallible. They're, they're, they may not even be clear, but, but they were written. Your teacher was trying to communicate truth to you. They were trying to, to communicate steps to do the experiment. And for that reason, you should look at it. You should look at the whole order. How many steps are there? What are the supplies I need? Do I have all the supplies? What are they trying to get me to do? You should try to imagine the, the experiment before you start. And then only after you truly understand what's on the sheet, what you're supposed to do, then you start doing the experiment. Same with a cookbook, with a recipe. Same with a history book. Same with a novel. You don't really know what the, the novel's about until you've actually read it. And some people skim it and you come to a conclusion that the author never had in their mind. We don't want to do that with God's word. The truth, right? It's, it's, we said the, magic, the power of God's word isn't like abracadabra. It's not the looking at it or the reading it out loud that brings power, but it's actually the truth that those, that's contained in those words, moving through your eyes, through your ears, into your heart, and then affecting your life is where the power is. So, so God's word was written to be understood. We have to do the work to understand it. And we know that work is worth it because of what the Bible is. So we start with observation. What does it say? And this, there's a, a helpful story. Um, happened once upon a time. Every single time I think of this step, in Bible study, I can't help but think of this story. And usually you want stories to be quick, especially when you're trying to teach a, a message. But I, this story has had such an impact in my discipline in Bible reading for the last 25 years was probably when I heard it. I shortened it a little bit from the version I read and made it a little easier to understand. But bear with me because I'm going to read you a story that I think, I, I pray, has a similar effect on your diligence of keeping your, your butt in the chair, your, your bottom in the chair, and your pencil in your hand, and your eyes in the text, to actually observe, to ask questions of the Bible. Observation has to be the first step towards understanding. So let me read you a story. It's a true story, but it happened like 100 some years ago, 150 years ago. There was a famous professor named Agassiz. He had a student, he had lots of students come to him. And this was written by one of the, the guys who came to study after, under this man. Over 15 years ago, I walked into the laboratory of the professor. I told him I signed up to study natural history and I was especially interested in studying insects. He asked me a few questions about why I wanted to study and what I hoped to do with my knowledge. Then he asked, do you want to focus on any particular area? I'd like to learn about all parts of zoology, I said, but I'm especially interested in insects. All right, when would you like to start? Now, I replied eagerly, 
Very well, he said with a smile, and he reached up to a shelf and he took down a large jar filled with a yellowish liquid. Take this fish, he said, handing it to me. It's called a hemulon. Look at it, and I'll ask you about it later. I looked around. There were no insects. He just left me alone with this dead fish. But soon he returned to give me specific instructions on how to take care of it. He reminded me that if I took it out of the jar, I had to keep it moist by occasionally pouring liquid from the jar over it. He reminded me to always put the stopper back on the jar. And then he told me to look at my fish. I wasn't thrilled. Studying a fish wasn't what I had in mind. I wanted to study insects. I didn't want to complain, so I did what he asked. He was a famous professor after all. In 10 minutes, I felt like I'd seen everything there was to see in that fish. I went to look for the professor, but he was nowhere to be found. Now that I knew everything there was to know about this fish, when I returned, the fish had started to dry out, so I wet it again. Then I sat and I stared at the fish. Half an hour passed, then an hour. The fish started to seem disgusting. I turned it over. I was tired of it. I looked at it from every angle, but it didn't help. I was bored and frustrated. Finally, I decided it was time for lunch, so I carefully put the fish back in the jar and left. And when I came back, I learned that Professor Agassiz had been in the lab, but had left again. My fellow students were too busy to talk. So reluctantly, I took the fish out again and continued my miserable task. I wasn't allowed to use any tools, he said, just my eyes, my hands, and the fish. I poked its mouth to feel the teeth. I counted its scales, but that seemed pointless. Then an idea came to me. I would draw the fish, and as I started to sketch it, I began to notice details I hadn't seen before. Drawing made me look more closely. Just then the professor returned. That's right, he said, looking at my drawing. A pencil is one of the best eyes. And he praised me for keeping the fish moist and the jar sealed. So what have you seen, he asked. I, I described the parts of the fish, the gills, the mouth, the eyes, the fins, the tail. He listened carefully, but seemed disappointed. You haven't looked very carefully, he said. You haven't seen one of the most obvious features. Look again. He left me and I felt upset. How could there be something so obvious I missed? Determined, I looked at the fish again. I spent the rest of the afternoon examining it, discovering one new thing after another. When the professor returned and asked if I'd seen it yet, I had to admit, no but I realized how little I saw before. He smiled. That's the next best thing, he said. Put away your fish and go home. Think about it tonight and we'll talk in the morning. He smiled. Or sorry, the next morning, the professor greeted me warmly with a smile. Do you perhaps mean, I ventured, that the fish had symmetrical sides with paired organs? That thought had come to me while I slept, dreaming of nothing but my fish. Exactly, he exclaimed, delighted. He talked about the importance of symmetry in animals. Then he said, now keep looking at your fish. For three more days, I studied that fish. Each day I noticed more and more details. The professor kept encouraging me to look, look, look. I began to understand the value of careful observation. This experience taught me more than any book or lecture could. Later, the professor gave me another fish to compare with the first, then another and another, until I'd studied the entire group of hemulons. I never could have seen what I saw in the other fish if I hadn't studied that first one so well, if I hadn't learned how to study with that first fish. 
The lab was filled with jars of fish, but the smell no longer bothered me. In fact, seeing an old jar now brings back fond memories. Through this process, I learned how to observe carefully and think deeply about what I saw. The professor often reminded me, facts are important, but they are just the beginning. You need to understand how they connect to bigger ideas but you'll never understand the bigger ideas without the facts. After eight months, I moved on to study insects, but the lessons I learned from that fish stayed with me. They helped me in all my future studies and have been more valuable than anything else I learned later. So I want you guys to think about that story of the fish and the, the importance of observation. Even think about the game that we played, how even asking the questions, you began to see things that you didn't see in the first 30 seconds. And probably because of those questions, you remember things that you wouldn't have remembered. You, you can see the picture now because we played the game, where if we hadn't played the game and you just looked at that for 30 seconds, the picture will be a blur in your mind now. What, what kind of lessons can we learn from those two illustrations about observation. That's not a hypothetical question. I want you to, uh, to shout out answers. What are some lessons that you guys can learn from about studying the Bible or reading a book from those lessons? To look deeper. What do you mean look deeper? Yeah, spend time looking at it for longer and deeper. There's more there than you, than you anticipated. There is always more to find. And that is true in scripture. Sometimes I'll set when I'm doing an observation list, when I'm starting a passage, I'm like, this is the passage I'm going to preach. This is a passage I'm thinking about teaching. What I'll do is I'll start with a page and it says observations at the top. And I do one through 30. I'm not going to end at 30. But I do 1 through 30, and I'm not even going to start thinking of anything else until I can get 30 observations down. And I'll tell you what happens almost every time. About like 5, 6, or 7, I'm like, shoot, I'm never getting to 30. And by, by the time I hit 30, I can easily go to 50 because you're, you're starting to see things in the text. It's, it's like the guy, on, he thought 10 minutes in, there's nothing more I'm going to see about this fish. But it took him a week, and he probably could have kept going at that point. And he, he knew that fish. He could dream that fish. And you know what happens when you start doing 30 observations on a verse? 50 observations on a verse? You accidentally memorize it. <laughs> and you, you know what's there because you're looking deeper. You're asking questions. What else? What else comes to mind? Gabby? So you have to push through boredom. Yeah, boredom is not your enemy. Sometimes you got to push through boredom to see, see what's interesting. And we are trained. Boredom's, we're trained to avoid boredom. Like, have you ever, I, I saw, heard a funny thing, like uh, Kiki showed me, it was a, a video, it was so, or a comedian. He's, he pulled up to a, uh, to a red light. He looked over and, and the person in the car next to him didn't have their phone up. And he felt like screaming out the window, what are you doing? You're wasting all this time. You could, you could totally be watching a video or surfing the web. Like you, you're wasting those 15 seconds. Do you feel like that? Like you, you get to a, I don't know if you guys do this. If you have phones in your pocket, like get on an elevator. I got a 15 second ride. Better see, see if I got any notifications, right? You, you hit a, you start getting bored. You sit there, you open up the Bible, you start to observe. I like, wonder how the Cowboys are doing. Right, I'm just gonna check real fast. Emmett, it's don't don't let your mind go there. They're probably losing. Um, boredom. We're trained to not like boredom, and we have so much stuff around us to kill the boredom. Oh, I'm bored. Fix it. No, I'm I'm bored. Let's just embrace this and push through. And I promise, if you're bored reading the Bible, the problem is you. It's not in the text. And yet, I know what you feel. Push through the boredom. What else? What else do you observe? 
you were, can you think of from, from the story that's helpful in observation? Is that Wendy or Lori? Lori? Yeah. That's that's good. So when you when somebody asks you a question or you start talking about it, so you can hijack that and do it for yourself. Your observations can be questions. Uh, more than half of mine are. Like sometimes it's just like, why is he talking about this now? <laughs> like if you ever read, you're like, okay, I, I might understand what this sentence means, but why did like why are Paul? Why did you bring this up right now? Asking that question can unlock things. Why are there three things in this list and not two? Oh, there's a list, right? Asking that question makes you notice there's a list. How are the things on the list related? What items are in the list? Oh, there's a location mentioned. Where's the location? I should look that up later. He went, right? Who are the people involved? Who's right? If it's a letter, who's writing the letter? To whom, it, to whom is the, the letter written? When did this happen? What was going on? You start looking at, at, a, at a specific text. We could think, for God so loved the world. Like, let's just think John 3.16, because most of you guys have that. Here's some of the observations you can have. Starts with the word for. That's weird. What's that there for? What's that when you see words like for, because, then? Circle them. Say, I need to figure that out. Just make the observation. Sentence starts with for. Subject is God. God did something. God loved. Who did God love? God loved the world. Now you have questions. Well, who in the world did God love? How was that love shown? What does the word so mean? Is that, a, is that describing like how much or is it, is it in the way that he, he loved? And you might think, I need to look in some other translations to get the answer. But do you see how you could start asking questions over and over and over in the text and in the the process of asking questions helps you see things you wouldn't have seen. Go back to the, the picture that we had. When we asked how many birds were in the sky, you noticed there were birds in the sky. You noticed what kinds of birds. You knew there were eagles. When you asked, that might have made you ask, are there birds anywhere else? Okay, there's three bluebirds. I, I, I didn't see the picture for that long. I think there were three, three bluebirds. Um, if you started asking the question about how many vehicles, what are they doing? What's the backstory of the people there? Is there anything common among the people? Asking the questions will let you observe things in the picture that you didn't see before. Asking the question, what am I missing? What's the clear thing I'm missing? What's the big picture question in this fish that Professor Agassiz wanted him to see? Pushed the student to look and look and look and think. And in the process, he started asking, how many teeth does this thing have? What direction did the teeth go? How many scales? Are they the same on both sides? Why does he have two eyes? Are the organs the same? He started asking lots of questions and observing. Spend time observing. So some helpful questions, and those are on your page, are who, what, when, where, why, and how. And there's more than that. You remember what the professor said some of the best eyes are? What was it? A pencil? Why? Why do you think that is? Does anybody have why do you think a pencil is one of the best eyes? What does that mean? That's right. Have you ever tried to draw something? All of a sudden you start catching details that you didn't see before. And if you just write out a verse, that's one of the reasons why your pastors and uh, so many of the students, they, they learn to diagram. There's nothing really magical about diagramming sentences, except it makes you think about every single word and it uses a pencil. So even if you don't know how to diagram something you can do, if there's a verse you want to know, write the verse out. 
think about every word as you write. Um, circle things, underline them, write your questions. Don't just ask the questions and make the observation in your head, but write them down. The pencil is one of the best eyes to help you see. So ask questions. Who wrote it? To whom did you write it? What? What is the connection between the sentences? What is the connection between the paragraphs? What words are there? It's crazy how many times. Sometimes it's like it takes me the 30th read through a verse, and I'm like, I, I never noticed that word was there. That's how dumb I am. Like, literally, I will sit here for like two hours studying a verse, and it's like two hours in, I'm like, I didn't even notice that word this whole time. Like, your, your brain just skips over it. That's why sometimes it's helpful to observe in two versions of the Bible, right? We... A lot of times we hear from legacy, standard up front. Get something else like a English standard or um, sometimes a less literal that might help you see, see other things like an NIV might be helpful not to have you say, which one do I like better, but to make you ask questions. Why does this one say it slightly different than this one? Why does this one use a different word than that one? Some of those answers you may, be, you may have a hard time getting. Some of them you may never be able to answer, but asking the question helps you observe. Zoom in and zoom out. Sometimes you need to zoom into the word level. Why is that word there? Sometimes you need to zoom out. Let's understand the whole book. Where does this book sit in Scripture? Is this in the New Testament or the Old Testament? What was the purpose of the book? What happened, right? what happened in the time when this book was written? Or zoom out if it's a story, if it's a book of history. What happened right before this? What happened right after this? If you're reading in the prophets, zoom out. When, when was this written? What was going on? Go read in the, in the books of history what was going on at that time and use a pencil to write all the players. Okay, who was this king? Who conquered who? Was this, which tribe was this? What happened? And all of a sudden writing it out, you're going to start to understand more and more and more. We could talk for hours and hours, and one of the best ways to do it is just to do it, to observe. So I just I hope this story, I hope that the illustrations encourage you that Bible reading shouldn't look like primarily sitting, do a one time over, and getting up and going. It doesn't mean that you can't move on from a text until you've spent a week looking at every single word, but I promise you, you could. There's more to be had there. And while you read, do the diligent thing of observing closely. I anticipate that observation, close observation and diligent reading is going to be really hard for everyone in this room. It's going to be especially hard for this generation. It's hard for everyone because it takes discipline. We are trained by everything outside of us, especially in recent years, to like short, mindless blips. We like bumper sticker slogans, right? We like, I know Twitter X is a, a thing of past, it, it used to be really short, just short blips. They like uh, TikToks or whatever the, the, the newest cool thing is where it's like a five, a five, 10 second blip. You just wanna do one thing, move on to the next, move on to the next, move on to the next. Don't think about it too long. Don't think about it too deeply. And certainly don't let it affect me. That's what the world is screaming at you. And you have to do the opposite with God's word. Get rid of distractions. When you read God's word, don't have the TV on in the background. Don't have words in the background going on. Sit down with just you and God's word. Clear away distractions. Pray. God, help me be disciplined to keep my face in this book, to actually see what you say so that I can understand it and be impacted and do it. And like Gabby said, you'll be bored. You might be bored like 10 seconds into it and just be like, oh, I can't wait to get through this because something, something exciting is going to happen or, or I'll come back to it in five seconds. I just need to check my phone. Or I need to get up and do such and such a thing. Push through that. Get rid of distractions and say, no, God's word is worth it. I will keep my bottom in this chair. I'm going to keep my face in God's word. 
and I'm going to plead with him to help me be disciplined, to actually read every word. All right, so after you've done that, making the observation is not the end goal. The observations merely help you with the next part, which is interpretation. So what is this picture all about? Uh, this picture is a picture of a place where you don't live at a time where you are not, with a guy dressed in a way that you do not dress. It points out that the Bible is written thousands of years ago in a language you don't speak to people who you are not who had a culture that you don't have and were in a situation that you that is not yours you are observing the text to understand what the author meant to the people he was writing paul wasn't writing to you right when you read the pentateuch when you read mosaic law you're not Israel in the wilderness. You're not Israel entering the promised land. And that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. You have to read to understand what did God and what did the original author want, the original recipients, to understand. That takes work because there's gaps, right? There's, you're over here. <laughs> We're going to cross a bridge. Forget the bridge is there right now, but there's a, a river of culture, language, time, situation, covenant. Culture, is that on there? Yeah, that's on there. There's, there's all these things that make it so hard for you to understand where you might raise more questions than answers. You may have to, you may, have, you may want to consult some tools. I don't know where such and such a city is. If I told you a story, hey, we're going to, after church, we're going to jump in the car, we're going to drive down to In-N-Out, you know, the one on Ray, and then, uh, and then, and then I'll take you home or, or something like that. You have a picture in your mind, if you know the city. Oh, I, I know right where In-N-Out is. And then, and then from there, we're going to drive over to, over to Gilbert. You know, we're going to go south and we're going to go east to Gilbert. You have that in your mind. But if, if we tell you that Abram, uh, he was from Ur, and, and he traveled, and, and we talk about the, the, the landmarks, and then you, you read about the Negev. There was a hill, and then overlooking, there was the Negev, and then there was the, the plains to the, to the west. If you don't know geography, you, you don't know what the Negev is. You're just, okay, that's a thing, and you don't know that the, you don't know that the Negev is a bunch of sand, and the, the plains are fertile valley. You, you might need help with that. That's because there's a cultural, there's a geographical gap. Sometimes you read and you're just like, huh, that's hard to understand. Why, why do these two verses, these two versions, use different words here? There's a language gap. Um, situation gaps. So often, if you guys were on the reading plan with us and you're reading in 2 Corinthians, there is a story going on, a story behind the story. Sometimes you have to ask questions. Wait, so, so what's going on? Why is Paul defending himself? There's clearly a situation that Paul found himself in. And there's lots of tools in the text to understand what was going on. But you have to ask those questions and say, Paul meant something to the original audience. I need to understand what that was before I start applying it to myself. The reality is we are reading other people's mail when you read God's word. You're reading other people's mail. And if you went to your neighbor's mailbox and you opened it up like it was your own, you're going to do some pretty funny things with it, right? But if you open it up and then you go to your neighbor and say, hey, you got a bill, right? If you open it up and you're like, shoot, there's a bill, I better pay it. That wasn't the intention. The bill was for your neighbor. Um, you're reading other people's mail. But what doesn't change between their time and ours, lots of things change between their time and ours. But I want you to think about some things that don't change between their time and ours. I'm going to jump ahead real fast. God doesn't 
change. God doesn't change between their time and ours. So that's why we ask, and this is why that's on those note sheets, what does the original meaning reveal about God? Right? We can learn something when God tells Israel, don't put tattoos on yourself, for I am the Lord. We can ask the question, well, does that mean that I can't put tattoos? Does that mean I can't shave my head? Does that mean I can't wear mixed fabrics? What was God saying? And you're saying this reveals something about God that doesn't change. We, we want to for, build a bridge from their time to our time. And we can't do that unless we understand what it revealed about God. And then you can ask the question, what does this reveal about man? Right? Since even if you're not the man in the story, you can learn something from Israel. Right? You look at Israel in the wilderness and the conclusion you should draw from Israel. Right? We've talked about this. They they got rescued miraculously out of Israel or out of Egypt. Plagues, right? You have all of these judgments on Israel culminating in the Passover. They run away. They're stuck at the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea, protects them from the Egyptian army with a pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, parts the Red Sea. They go across. God kills the army. God provides water, provides food for them. And over and over and over again, what do they do? Grumble. They, well, they grumble, they complain, they're anxious. They don't trust God. The moral of that story is not, Israel's so dumb. <laughs> the moral of that story is, wow, my human depravity that I was born with too makes us do really dumb things. Sin is really dumb. I sin. I shouldn't desire evil like they did. Does that make sense? You, you see something about God. God's demands are not wrong. God's demands are right. God's demands reveal something about his good and perfect character. God has the right to make these demands. And he actually cares about our good when he tells us what we should do. And when I sin and I don't trust him, I'm being just like Israel. I shouldn't do that. What else doesn't change? What happens when a holy God interacts with sinful humanity? Sometimes we're judged, right? Nadab and Abihu, they disobey, fire. Sons of Korah, uh, disobey, the earth opens up and swallows them. David, he disobeys commits murder and adultery. There's consequences and God forgives him. Abraham, man of faith. God looks at his faith and declares him righteous. We learn a lot when we say, what does this text reveal about God? God, you're holy. God, you're trustworthy. God, you're eternal. God, you're, and we could fill in the blank all afternoon, all evening. What does this reveal about man? We're sinful. We should confess. We need to repent. Um, I deserve judgment. But God offers forgiveness and adoption as sons. So then we move from, we've observed the text, we've seen what it meant to the people in their time. And then we ask the question, what effect must it have on me? I'm not making this up. This, this process, I think, is, is revealed in these verses. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 11. This is speaking of that example I told you of Israel in the wilderness said, now these things took place as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. I want you to just observe something in this text. 
it doesn't say, and this is something that observation does, it doesn't say Israel provides us a good example. It doesn't say we can learn from Israel. It said these things took place as examples for us. These things happened to them as an example for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. God had a purpose in Israel's rebellion. When you read that, Moses didn't have you in mind. Little A author didn't have you in mind. Big A author had us in mind. As he wrote it, they were written down for our instruction, our instruction. They were written down for the Corinthians' instructions. We understand that. We can bring it to us. We can build that, that bridge. But we, we observe this and we say, wow, God, you are really big in your sovereignty. You actually had me in mind. Now when we read Israel, our solution is, or our, our conclusion, our moral isn't, man, Israel's so dumb. I, I'm thinking of Mater when I say that. Israel's so dumb. But it's, it's, it's not, not like, not that it's, oh God. Korah disobeyed and the ground opened up and swallowed them. So that I don't desire evil. That's a big deal. Um, in Romans, whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. So we need to take that bridge. We don't, it's not enough to say, yep, I know what's in the text. I can win Bible trivia. Or say, I can explain what it was supposed to mean to them but say, no, God had me in mind. God wrote these down for our instruction. What was written in the former days was written for our instruction. I should read it, and I need to apply it. So our application needs to be more than what should I do? It needs to include that, but, but I like to say for application, what effect should it have on me? What effect must this have on me? And I gave you a list of seven things, seven questions that you can ask of every text. Are there examples to follow? Are there commands to obey? Are there errors to avoid? Are there sins to forsake? Are there promises to believe? Are there principles to live by? What specifically needs to change in my thinking or living? Right, we need to, sorry, we need to understand what it meant in their day, in their time, to them. Whatever it is, we don't read ourselves first in the text. Right, when... We don't read us. When, it, when God makes a promise, we want to say, I want to make sure that promise applies to me. Or was that just a promise to them? Then we cross over this bridge by asking those questions. What does this reveal about God? What does this reveal about man? What does this reveal about when, when God and man interact? And then we cross that bridge so we, we can bring it from their time into our time because it, God really did intend it for our good. And then it goes out into our lives and affects the way that we live. I encourage you to be specific in your application. When God is made known, worship him immediately. When sin is revealed, repent immediately. When application is discovered, initiate it immediately. So on your note-taking sheets, right, what are the three questions that you have? What does the text say? Right, what, is that the first one? What is the first question? Oh yeah, sorry. What is the? I thought the first one. I should probably grab it. What is the? What is the original meaning? Reveal about God. Isn't that the second one? What is the text? Sorry. What? Sorry. On your note-taking sheets, the first question when you're when you're in the Bible. Sorry, your daily Bible reading sheets. Sorry, not not on these. On your in your binders on the note sheets that you fill out each day. When you're reading, 
You see how the, sorry, I wasn't clear on the question. I set you up for failure. Do you see how the first question, do you see what the first question is? What does it say? So what is that? That's observation and interpretation. What does it say? So you got to look at it and you probably want a paper other than that one to make those observations. Jot it down as you're, as you're reading. Maybe get a Bible you can write in where you can circle stuff and underline it and put questions in the margins. And then when you're done, say, what does it say? And, and try to have that answer be, what did it mean to the original people? What was going on? What did it say? And try to summarize that. And then you move on to the next question, which is, how must this, or what does this reveal about God? Because that helps us take it, not just leave it in their time. Oh, Israel's so dumb, or God did some really cool stuff with Israel, or um, whatever you might learn about a, a New Testament church or a, a fact of theology. But you say, what does this teach me about God? You can ask those other questions. What does this teach me about man? What does this teach me about when man and God interact? But when you ask that question, you're acknowledging that Scripture, God's Word, is not primarily a history book. It's not primarily an instruction book. It's not primarily a book of commands. But at its very essence, it's a book that reveals God to us. And so if every time you ask, what does this reveal about God? And you can write an answer, worship. Don't be content to just write that answer down. Stop and pray right there. Make a practice after you fill out that second line. Saying, worship God for what he just revealed. And then ask the question, well, in light of that and everything else I just learned, how, how must this affect me? How must this affect me? How does this affect your view of God, your love of God, your fear of God, your heart and obedience to God, your worship of God, your trust in God, your view of yourself and relationship to God? How does it affect your thoughts, your desires, your attitudes, your belief, your deeds, your priorities, your prayers, your actions, your joy, your sorrows, your goals, your time, what you watch on TV? what you do with your time, if you watch TV, how you interact with your parents, how you interact with your siblings, how you interact with your friends, your relationships, what job you're going to take, how you work at your job, your church, what you do when you're at church, how you think about the people in your church, your home, your possessions. You could go on and on and on. But you don't want to go there first. You don't want to say, hey, I, I want to find a verse that helps me. Or you don't want to jump into, into God's word just saying, hey, I want to see me first in the text. You don't want to skip the original meaning in the hard work to see what's actually in God's word to try to get the easy pickings of, um, I guess, a, a feel-good theology or a a, a devotional reading. I just want to read something for three minutes and get up, go on my day, and feel good about myself. Do the really hard work of reading God's Word, understanding what it means, and then out of that, actually having your life affected. So on that last part, on that, how does, must this affect me? Be specific. Don't say, I need to sin less. If this revealed sin to you, whatever you're seeing in God's word, don't write, I need to sin less. Say, when I blank, it is sin. And then write what repentance looks like. Right? Don't just say, I should worship God better, but actually write and then do it how you're going to do it. Um, be very specific in your application and be immediate in your application. So where we are going from here, I know I talked for a really long time. This was the last of the how to study your Bible lessons, just straight up lessons. But what we're going to do next week is you have this, the last, the last four lessons, the life is short, read the Bible. 
and then the, the three lessons on uh, how to read the Bible. And um, you're going to have almost the whole time in discussion group. So your discussion group leaders are going to think through for each one of you and your age and who you are, how you guys, I want you guys to just talk freely, talk openly, talk honestly about how studying God's word is going. Um, where this is easy, where this is hard. If something is unclear, be prepared to ask them about it. So next week we're going to have long discussion groups. I, I beg you, I encourage you to be open and honest in those groups. Um, your teachers, your, your, your discussion group leaders, they're here because they love you, they care for you, and they know how to read God's word. They're doing these things. So open up your life to them. Open up your life to one another. Encourage each other in this. Um, so next week you're going to have extended discussion groups. And then the week after that, I hope to have the start of, of some Q&As. You probably have some questions about some of the, the theology that was said, maybe some of the verses we referenced, some of the, the how-tos. Put those in the box, but let your, your discussion group leaders know. Um, and we'll see how many Q&A weeks or, or what we need to go from there uh, to, to finish this up. So thank you guys so much for bearing, bearing with this. I know this was a long, long lesson, um, but I, I do pray that it bears fruit in your life. Let me pray, and then you guys can grab snacks and we're dismissed. God, thank you for your word and making it understandable to us. It's not easy, though but it is understandable. And I, I pray that you would help these students recognize just what a treasure your word is. How precious it is that we have your word in our own language, in our laps, with all of these tools to help us understand it. And God, thank you for the minds that you've given us and the education that we've received. And God, I pray that tomorrow as they open your word, they would have a newfound appreciation and a newfound desire to sit and read and read well. And that, that wouldn't just end at observation, but you would take it through to an understanding of the text and then push it all the way through that you would impact their life. God, your word is truth and it sanctifies us. God, your word is powerful and it opens up our lives. It lays our hearts bare before you. You love to work miracles with your word. And God, that does come, we know, through diligent, careful observation and reading of it. Thank you for those who have given their lives that we might have your word in our language. I pray that we would not abuse this privilege. Now, God, before we go, I just want to remember again, we prayed this morning for them. The, the village in Maororo and our missionaries who are there translating your word. There's a tribe that has Ephesians now. And I pray that you would be doing miracles with the unleashing of your word into the tribe there on the mountaintop. Thank you for the sacrifice of the cans that Jude, Oliver, they would love to be here with us. Um, God, we pray for them and we're so grateful for them that they are sacrificing so much that a people can have this word in front of them that we have in front of us in our own language. Please work miracles in all of us as we read. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.